about our church is that we believe very strongly in the importance of the holistic approach uh, to us, meaning that we are not just concerned about our spiritual life, we are also concerned about our physical and mental life as well. And we've all gone through a lot in these last couple of years. And so uh, every month we dedicate a certain part of our service to what we call a health care moment, whether it's a physical health care moment, whether it's a mental health care moment, and whether it's Dr. Lindauer, Dr. Button, Sister Emily, and this morning we are blessed to have uh, Mother Amanda Trotter Fleming, and we're grateful to have her and her husband here with us uh, today as she shares with us uh, an important opportunity for health care, and we pray, gosh, I think I just got $50. I just got $50. I want you to know that is so great. Anytime a cell phone goes off in the sanctuary, remember that's a $50 fine. And it goes, I just want you to help you, it goes to the pastor's new car fund. And right now, it's really sweet watching a few of you looking in your purses, you're, you're grabbing your thing and saying, wait a minute, I need to take care of that. So I just want you to know, I never usually say that except at, the, uh, at a, a homegoing service or something like that, but I heard it today. And I know it didn't come from out here, I know it came from the choir stand. So, you know, I just want you to know it is a good idea to check that thing right now and make sure that it's on uh, silence or on, uh, what is that other thing called? Vibrate. Vibrate. Vibrate, yeah, that's it. Or turn it off. But I just want you to know that, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Somebody said, hey, Pastor, how do you know that, um, you know, the, uh, where, the, where the phone call was? I said, well, we've got wonderful uh, video spotters. I said, have you ever gotten a ticket in the mail? And I said, that's a ticket that you didn't realize you were going to get, but they had a you know red light or whatever camera there, and that camera took the picture. I got one of them one time, y'all. And, and I'm telling you, I wanted to say for sure, I looked at it, I said, that was JJ behind the wheel, that wasn't me. Or that was Elder that was behind the wheel, that wasn't me, but I had to pay. Actually, I didn't have to pay the ticket, I did this. I, I signed up for the class. If you sign up for the class, then you go to the class, they take the ticket off your record. I know somebody knows what I'm talking about. You know why? Because when I went, <laughs> there were 125 people in the class, and one of them was another pastor, and I cracked up. We looked at each other. We were on Zoom. We looked at each other and the whole bit, but I don't know about you, if it's a $200 ticket, but I can go to a class for $105, guess where I'm going? Amen. There you go. Mother, will you come on? We're grateful to have you and your husband here today. This is, a Robert Lowe wanted to make sure in the first service that I said this is his cousin. Amen. Amen. So she's going to give us a presentation about health care. And then out in the, um, in the lobby area, there are books uh, that uh, you can certainly give donation to. She's got a, a, a paperback book and also a hardback book, 15 for one, 25 for the other. Uh, but we're really grateful that she is here today, and thank you for your message. Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Oh, come on now. Praise the Lord, everybody. and stuff. 
yourself, if you run, you run. If you take care of yourself, you can live a long time and be healthy. Because we wasn't intended to be sick. We got these, 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 these parts, the kidneys and the liver and stuff, to push all that poison out of us. So what we're going to do is do what God asked us to do. And we'll come out all right, won't we? Amen. 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 So he's taking care of your heart. Taking care of your heart. That's what he's doing. He's taking care of that, you know, that high blood pressure, diabetes, and, and cancer. The fiber in this here apple, the fiber flushes all of it, it detoxes your body and causes no cancer in the body. So, but they all working together to keep us healthy. All these nutrients working to keep it. And then you can rest good at nighttime. And then you can get up with energy in the daytime. So God is a good God. And so what we have here, we have God's natural medicine. God, God's natural medicine that he has ordained for us to have in our physical body. But he also has, this, this young man here, 21 capsules a day for about 30 years. Uh, having seizures, the doctor said he would. He'd always be sick. But when they said, when you put God on the book, when you say that, you just messed up. Because God healed him. God healed him, gave him a book of poems, and gave him a testimony. So, so all you have to do is to be obedient, read the book, but please be obedient to God. And let him work it, up, work it out for you. Every food that God made is good for you. If he created it, it's good for you. Amen. So God bless you, and you have a blessed day. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mother. We appreciate that. Again, we are grateful for her message this morning. And if you would like to have one of the books that she's sharing, you'll see to do that after the service today. We're ready for our baptismal candidate. We are grateful for Brother Smith, who grew up here in Portland. He is uh, actually related, or rather has had a good friendship with uh, Elder Wilder. And we're grateful for him today. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. So remember, as you go down, it's good. You're going to come this far back as you please. You got it? You got it? You got it? Brother Smith, we are grateful. This is your church family. We thank God for you and thank God for what he's been doing in your life and the decision that you made to make Christ your choice. We thank God for that and thank God for you. In obedience to the divine command and upon the profession of your faith, my brother, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. So, you got something to you got something to to the say? service, I heard Elder Hennessy, our First Lady, say this, 
Then I heard Sister Della say this, and now here I am about to say the same thing. Do y'all know what just happened? If you know what just happened, is that we baptized somebody who gave their life to Christ. Somebody ought to stand. This is a moment to celebrate. It's not a moment to be seated. So I want everybody to stand who can stand and give God a big hand to pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Again, this, this uh, young man has made a decision. I start laughing when Elder Wilder, because I know how old she is. She said, we grew up together. And I looked at him and I said, you didn't grow up with Elder Wilder. He said, oh, yes, I did. She kept trying to figure out how many years between the two of them. Um, but we are thank we thank God. Because see, any time somebody gives their life to Christ, that's a big deal. That is nothing, nothing small at all. And guess what? After this morning service, a couple that Brother Bill uh, Jackson invited to church. They've come to church about, I think, two or three times. They gave their life to Christ this morning and joined Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church as well. Amen? That is, that is a big deal. Amen. Uh, Elder Tabor, I know, is covering the door right now, so I'm going to ask everyone to stand who are able to stand. If you are, please do and join us in this other part of our worship which is the ability for us to be able to share in tithes and offering. And what we would ask, if you would, and, and um, Brother Ethan, if you would look right in my Bible right down here, it is my blue envelope as well. You, there are many ways for you to give to the church, and that is through the blue envelope, if you're here in the sanctuary, through Cash App, which is dollar sign Vancouver Avenue, you can also go to our website, Tithely, and uh, make sure to give there. But we really believe, on the one hand, in tithe and offering. What we don't believe is that we ought to talk about more about money more than we talk about Christ. Amen belongs right there. And I can tell you that for the uh, when I was interviewed by the interview team in, I believe it was, good grief, that was so long ago now, sometime I think in the summer of 2004, I told them that that was one of the things that I would not do, and I'm grateful to God that in almost 18 years now, that has not been where the complete focus has been as well. Amen? So let us take our tithes and offering. Oh God, we come in the name of Jesus. Thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you for guiding our lives and strengthening us. And Lord, as we give back right now, we pray a blessing over everyone and everything they give. And we pray, Lord, because we know that if you can take a little boy's lunch and feed 20,000 people and still have 12 baskets left over, we know that you can take our tithes and offering and you can do a miraculous things. Um, pressed down, shaken together, running over. In your precious holy name we pray and give these gifts. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. And we want to say thank you. Thank you for the gifts that you give. And just know that we are doing our part to uplift the kingdom and the ministry of God here on earth. We've got two youth ushers in the Iowa. way. Uh, one of them is going to have a birthday this week, Sister Donna and her twin brother. <clears throat> we also want to recognize the other November birthdays. We've got a bunch of them. Look at the back of your bulletin. But I see Sister Holmes is here. I see Deacon Ward is here. And on today, we're still celebrating our First Lady, whose birthday was last Friday. And we are grateful to God for, for her. Amen.
uh, particular book, but he's also uh, the scriber of uh, the book of Acts as well. What we see in the text is a very interesting and important parable that Jesus is telling, reminding us of how many of us squander what God has given us. I'm, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say, say that one more time because... Sometimes, you know, how often we bother God and worry God and, and keep praying about, Lord, what, you, what we want him to give us. And, and the reality is God gives us a lot of things and we mess up a lot of stuff. I, I, I know I don't have a witness there, but, but you know, Deacon, Deacon Stewart and I know that we have messed some things up in life. And the fact of the matter is there's a few others of us in here. You may not admit it, and this is not confession. But the fact is, sometimes we are praying for a whole lot more than we ought to be talking to God about how much we have messed up up to this point. Do I have a witness here today? And not that we should continue to feel guilty about the things that we have done, that we have gone to God and we have asked for repentance for. Because you see, if you go to God and ask for repentance, God is better than us. Because I don't know about you, I've got relatives and friends and stuff like that. They'll remind you of mess ups that you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they'll keep on talking about it. No, you've already gone to God and asked God for forgiveness. You've already said that you were sorry in some way or another, but you get held hostage by the fact that because uh, humanity has this thing about saying this is where the church should not be emulating the world because the world will say, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. Yeah. Yeah. I, I came to tell you that that is not the way God expects us because the fact is I'm so glad that I've got a God and you've got one and if you don't know him we want to introduce you to him because there's no way in the world that he would say I'll forgive you but I won't forget you because what he does when he literally does his work with us and accepts the apology accepts the fact that we have said, I have messed up. He erases it as if it has never happened at all. I am grateful because here's what we know we need. Uh, God looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it would help us if we would look at one another in the same way. Do, do I have a witness here? I, I'm, I'm a believer sometimes that... We want to be more Christ-like, but it's important that we recognize what Christ looked like, what God looked like, because what he looked like is an ability to be able to say, I love you so much that I want you to be able to meet your fullest potential. I don't want you to hold yourself back because of where you've been and what you've done. I sat in a room yesterday with 50 or 60 people who have come through drugs and alcohol and they were able to say I've been clean 30 years I've been clean 20 years I've been clean however it was all of them had a story and I sat there and listened with my heart to say look at God and what he does and one of the people said you know what I'm in AA and I have a problem with AA he said I quit going because I got tired of telling everybody my name is so and so and I am an alcoholic and I was so glad he said that because my belief is that you may have been an alcoholic, but that does not define you now. Amen. It's important for you to be able to say, I'm in AA, but I am a child of God, and he has forgiven me for the mess-ups that I have made in life. I shared with them some of my own confession and told them I'm so glad that we've got a God who's able to forgive us and see us different, even if humanity will not. We are blessed people. Do you know that, people? We are blessed people to serve a God who is working with us, walking alongside with us, and wanting to see us reach our full potential. Because there's something about God that some people don't seem to realize, and that is that almost everybody he used in biblical history was somebody who had an issue or two. Do I have a witness here? And every one of them, he looked past their issues to help them become everything that they had the potential to become. And more than that, that they could be an example for every one of us. There was none of them perfect, but all of them were subject to God and all of them had stuff 
that they had to deal with. Amen. The text here tells us that Jesus was telling a story. He nestles this statement between the story about the man who was going to another country to accept his kingdom. And by the way, what he was doing was leaving them, uh, each of them, a certain number. This is different than the way it reads in Matthew 25 when you look at the story of the talents, but the message is still the same. In other words, he says, I'm leaving all of these uh, gifts with you, and I want you to deal with these gifts while I'm gone. I'm going to come back, but while I'm gone, I want to make sure that you've got something for yourself. I want you to deal with this uh, uh, for yourself. And he gave this to each one of them. And, and you see, this statement is nestled between that and the witness for what they actually did with what they were given. And so I want to stay in the crevice, if you will, the crevice saying, occupy until I come. As we look at it, one of the things that we need to remember is that we need to live our lives as if God is really who God says he is. Let, let me pause for a minute because, you see, it's easy to say that I'm a child of God. It's easy to say I believe in him and I'm a Christian. But the issue is, do we act like it? A amen, amen, Wall. Do we act like it? What does that mean? I'm not talking about bad behavior. I'm talking about the character of God where he is able to love us even though there are times when we're not lovable. Do I have a witness here? He's able to see through us and recognize that in many of us, we are trying to do the right thing, but we get sidetracked and messed up. And that's why we sing songs like Shake the Devil Off, because the fact is some of us don't just need to shake him off. We need to take a bath and wash him off. Come on now. Amen belongs right there. The fact is, that's it. Because he occupies certain parts of our mind, our body, and our spirit. I know I've got a witness somewhere here. Uh, it, it's not that we should be blaming everything on us because he can't go any further than we allow him. Do I have a witness here somewhere? And, and we, can, we can blame it all we want to on him. The question is, did we open the door to let him do what he does? And the reality for every one of us is a reminder that Satan is not ubiquitous. What does that mean, preacher? He's not everywhere all the time. I want you to know that he does not have the power that God has. And I need to stop somewhere and tell you that not only does he not have the power that God has, he doesn't have the power you and I have. Do I have a witness here? What do you mean by that, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. You see, Satan really is not powerful because he doesn't own anything. All he can do is try to occupy and rent up space in you and me. And I came to tell you that there are times that people need to remember that he is nothing but an interloper and we've got to give him an eviction notice and let him know, no, you're not going to do that here. And the reality is that we've got to be able to say that. I've got to be able to say, no longer will you occupy my mind, my spirit, my body. I've got to say, you are no longer welcome here. I want to give you an eviction notice. And if you're wondering what the eviction notice looks like, all you need to say is Jesus. Because James said, at the name of Jesus, Satan must flee. I know I've got a witness somewhere. The text reminds us that he gave them a chance. He went away, but he said, I'm going to give you some stuff. I'm going to leave this with you. And, and I don't want to deal with what they did when he came back. I want to deal with what he said when he said to them, occupy until I come. You see, the fact of the matter is, God is looking at every one of us. That there is indeed an important relationship that we ought to have with him. I came to tell you that our relationship with God ought to be stronger today than it's ever been. I'm going to pause for just a minute. It ought to be stronger than it's ever been. What does that mean, preacher? That means that we ought to have more God in us than we've ever had. And Satan ought not be able to distract us and get us off track if we really love God the way we say we love God. Come on, somebody. The reality is that while we're waiting for him to come back, and I need to put this in context for you, they were waiting for him to come back from the kingdom that he was being given. 
We are waiting for Christ to come back because the fact of the matter is, do I have a witness here? He is coming back one day. Do, do, do I have a witness somewhere that, that he is on his way back one day? And he said that while he's gone to take care of the other kingdom, he said, I want you to know that in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas and his cousin said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, but we know one thing for sure. How can we know the way? Well, I want you to know that he said it to Thomas in the first century, and he's shaking hands with us in the 21st century and telling us, I need you to know that I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light that no person comes into the Father but by me. My friends, we need to know that this is our time to occupy, but what are we going to do with our occupation? I came to tell you that one of the good news about what we can do is continue to strengthen the relationship that we have with God, that we can pray more, that we can read up more, that we can reach out to our brother and sister, that we can give a helping hand to somebody that needs it, that we can tell somebody about who Christ is, and yes, we can live like a child of God. Somebody ought to be able to tell that you know what, I don't know what it is, but there's something different about him. There's something different about her. There's something different about that child. And the reason why is that when God gets in your DNA, I promise you, it'll change some things. Do I have a witness here? Not only will it change stuff, it'll transform stuff. It'll make us walk different and talk different and think different and believe different and do our part to try to be the kind of person, an ambassador that God needs us to be. He said to them, I'm giving you this, and I want you to occupy until I come. I want to tell you today that God has given us something too. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm so glad that we serve a God that when you get saved, you don't have to worry about somehow waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. It's already there. Because you see, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit hang together. Do I have a witness here? They've got a relationship with one another. Uh, we don't know anything in humanity about team spirit and team sport until we start looking at the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and watch that they don't argue with one another. They don't fuss with one another. They don't talk about each other behind the other's back. They are always there to support and encourage one another. That's exactly what it's all about. And guess what? If I'm talking bad about my brother or sister, I'm talking bad about myself. Do I have a witness here? And we need to know that we are, we are God's children and the fact of the matter is, if we've got the Holy Spirit within us, it'll help us ignore a whole lot of junk that comes our way. Because I came to tell you, junk is going to come your way, but the reason why it comes your way is because the enemy wants to see you get upset and angry and all of those things. I came to tell you that we need to smile at the devil and the enemy and remind them, I'm a child of God. I've got the Holy Spirit within me and I don't have to fight my battle. God will fight my battle for me and he never lost a case. <laughs> Occupy until I come, meaning that for sure I'm coming back. But while I'm gone, don't act like an orphan child. Y'all catch that on the way up, Martin Luther King. D don't act like you haven't been taught well. When I was growing up in my second foster family, the walkers used to tell me when I would leave the house and go into the neighborhood, don't forget what your name is. And then that was my reminder as to how I'm supposed to act. And, and, and let, me, let me give you a reminder. This is what, it, it didn't really dawn on me what they were trying to say until I went to, cause see, I, I lived in, a, I lived on the other side of the tracks, y'all. Y'all didn't. Y'all, y'all, y'all may have grown up in, in, you know, in middle class. I grew up in working class, and different than uh, my brother, my chairman of the deacon board, who thinks I've never done any hard work before. I did a whole lot of hard work. But here's the other thing: uh, there was nobody around us but people that looked like us. And then when they start busing us in, they bust us into junior high and high school. 
And when I start going to some of my friends' house who didn't look like me, and I saw the way they talked to their parents, somebody didn't hear me. I heard the way some of them talked to their parents in ways that if I had talked to my parents that way, I would have been knocked into the middle of the next week because there's no way I would talk to them that way. There's no way I would do, now listen, I might go to the other room. Don't act like we didn't. You know good and well we were upset, but we sure wouldn't go say nothing in front of them. And if you had the experience I did one time, I went to the other room and I started mumbling under my breath and they said, I can hear you, I want you to know that. But I saw that and that reminded me that I had a responsibility to act a certain way. And so it wasn't always just about the fact that they drilled into you how you were supposed to act. After a while, it became our DNA. We knew better than to act that way. We would not want to act that way. And I remember one time when I was about 16 and I, I thought, you know, at 16 and you start getting hair growing on your, uh, your, your lip, you think that you're a man. Y'all don't hear me. Uh, 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 and I was dumb enough when Mr. Walker said he was 5'9 and he was about 40 years older than I was. And, and, and I was about 15 or 16, and I had the nerve to grumble back to something he said in front of me, uh, in front of him. And before I knew it, that man slapped me so hard in the head that I saw stars. I'm not making it up. But I know one thing's for sure, I found out I would never do that again. Amen? Not at all, because I learned over time that I do not want to do that in terms of what I want to be, the person I want to grow up to be. And even as adults, we've made our share of mistakes. Do I have a witness here? Even as adults, we've made our share of mistakes. We dealt with shame and all that other stuff. We need to understand that our God is saying to every one of us, yes, we were wrong. Yes, we messed up. Yes, we ought to be ashamed. In fact, I think it's dangerous for a person to do wrong and not be ashamed of the wrong that he or she did. Amen belongs right there. But what I know is that we have to be able to accept that the God that we serve is saying, that during this time of my absence, I'm expecting you to use the power of the Holy Spirit to grow you, to develop you, and to make sure that you are becoming the person you have the potential to become. How do you do that? I'm so glad you asked. Just like a person goes to Planet Fitness or people who like to eat a certain way and make sure that they don't eat meat or something like that, or they don't eat sweets and that kind of stuff. If we're that concerned about our body, we ought to be that concerned about our soul. And I came to tell you that when it comes to our soul, we need to remember that oftentimes during our occupation, that occupying until Jesus comes, we need to remember that sometimes we are allowing some things in that we should not allow in, and we need to push those things out, whether it's shake it out, whether it's bathe it out, whether it's whatever, it's a, whatever it is, we need to be able to do that. Do I have a witness here today? And so what the lesson is for us is to remember that God's given us, amen, a certain amount of talent as well. And the real issue is not what somebody else hasn't done. It's about what we haven't done ourselves. How many times do we look at ourselves and say, when I got to this age, I expected to do this or that or the other. I expected that I would have this or that or the other. And we look at ourselves and say, I don't have any of that, those things. I came to tell you that, guess what? It is important that we remember that we have whatever God felt we can manage. Do I have a witness? Because one thing's for sure, you've seen people that win the lottery. I know y'all don't pay attention to the lottery, especially when it was over a billion dollars. I know you didn't buy a ticket or anything. You were not phased by it, whatever. But what you know is that there are too many people that have won huge amounts of money, and within a matter of a couple of years or a few years, they've lost it all because they were not ready. I pray today that you understand that part of what this text lesson is about is the reminder that God is saying to every one of us, I've given you a certain amount. The question is, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to manage it? What way are you going to make it better? I think I said from this pulpit not long ago that when you look at 
If you talk to anybody in IT, it uh, uh, who, who knows anything about computers or laptops or even our phones, we use about 25% at the most of what that particular instrument can do. And yet, I believe sometimes that's the way we are with our God. God's got 100%, 100% of stuff that he will do for every one of us, but we're only going and moving along at about 25%. Right? That's really what it's about. If we wonder why we only have 25%, we need to look at what we're giving back. I'm going to pause for a minute for station identification. The fact is we need to remember that it's not just about getting on our knees and asking God to do so much for us. The reality is God does more for us than we even deserve. But the real thing is, is how much are we doing to say, God, thank you for what you have done. Let me go out and try to bless somebody else. Let me go out and try to encourage somebody else. Let me go out and try to do what I can to make somebody else's life as great as you have made mine. In the occupation time, my friends, until he comes, he ought to be able to come back and find us on our post. He ought to be able to find us loving folks that may not be that lovable. He ought to find us forgiving folks and not holding grudges. He ought to be able to find us finding our way to try to help somebody else to pick them up because they are down, to help somebody and remind them and encourage them. I've been there too, brother or sister, but I promise you, because of God, that's the reason why I'm able to talk the way I talk, witness the way I witness, sing the way I sing, because God picked me up one day and he turned me around, transformed my life and gave me another chance. I want you to know, I don't stand in judgment of you. I stand in encouragement of you because you are wonderfully and beautifully made in the image of God. Do I have a witness here? That's what it's all about. So when we think about it, often one says, and I'm about to round third and head for home, but often people say, well, I just can't do that. You're absolutely right. You can't on your own do that. But here's what I know. Let me, let me open up a new chapter for you today. You can do it if you leave it with God and not yourself. Do, do I have a witness here? As long as you're depending on yourself, you're absolutely right. You can't. But trust me, I've had some people that have made me so angry and upset that I couldn't see them. I wanted to spit in their face. But I found out that I, that's, only, that's, only, that's only minuscule gratification. There's something really great about people that you know did nothing but try to blow your life up and talk bad about you and stuff like that. And when you see them, you can smile and say, how you doing? That's what Paul meant when he said something about throwing hot coals on somebody's head. Do I have a witness here? Because the reality is I don't own it anymore. The reason why I don't own it is because God has it. And if you've given it to God, you ought to be walking around with all that stuff still on you. You ought to be able to walk around knowing that I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the love of Jesus in my mind. I've got the love of Jesus in my soul. And even if I have to pray before I say hello to him, I'm going to pray and say hello because I'm not about to stoop to the level of where they are. I just learned the other day, somebody said, what somebody who's been smiling in my face said to them and, and all that and what they had to say about me. And I just said, you know, there was a time when I'd get really upset about that. I came to tell you, and this is why we as preachers sometimes try to tell you some of our stories so that you don't assume that we're not living the same life that you're living. So just the other night, this person said some stuff and told me what somebody else said. And I want you to know I didn't get mad at all. I didn't get upset at all. I didn't get bothered at all. Because I know very well when that person has been in need, I've been right there for him. When that person has been down, I've been right there for him. And guess what? Whether I knew what they said or not, if they're messed up tomorrow, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go right there and I'm going to do anything I can to help them anyway. Because if I'm the ambassador in the midst of this occupation, I'm determined because God has given me gifts and given you gifts. We need to use them for good. We need to use them for encouragement. We need to use them for love. And we need to use them to lift people out the muck and the miry clay that every one of us has been in. We ought to be determined not only to do our part, right, but help this person begin to do their part right. I know somewhere in this audience there's somebody saying, are you ever going to go to that person and tell them what you heard? I'm absolutely not. They're not worth it. 
Let me try that one more time. Y'all didn't hear me. They're not worth it. And if I do that, I'm only going into the acid. I'm already above the acid right now. The problem for them is they've got the acid on them. And they've got to deal with their own consciousness. Because the reality is that God has saved us and made us beautifully and wonderfully. And today, you need to accept the fact that we are his children. And in the midst of this occupation, he's given you and me gifts to make our lives better and to literally make the lives of others better. And the fact is that when he comes back, I want him to be able to say, like he said with others, the one that said, I took what you gave me and I made even more of it. I don't want him to look at us and be able to say that he gave us and we don't have any of it anymore. No, I want him to be able to look at us and say, you know what? I took what you gave me, God. I took what you gave me and I used it in a beautiful way. I invested it just like you would want me to invest it. And I need you to know, now I'm going down to the second part of this passage. That means that when you come back, I came to tell you that, Lord, I have made and made and made and multiplied everything that you gave me and I'm shocked about how much got multiplied. But Lord, here's what I want you to know. It all belongs to you. Do I have a witness here? It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. So we must remember to occupy until he comes. Don't be upset about what you don't have. Pray to God that you will become worthy and ready of the stuff that he has for you and me, and that we will utilize it in the right way. Amen? Amen. Do I have a witness here somewhere? Let's stand and give God a big hand of praise. He's worthy to be praised. As I said this morning, there were two who came and gave their life to Christ. If there's anybody here who, by the way, you've tried everything else, and yet what you find is that you're in the same mess that you've always been in. Well, I come to tell you that when I hear that we serve a God who loves us, we serve a God who forgives us, we serve a God who doesn't hold it against us, we serve a God who's able and willing and looking forward to taking us to the next level. That when we talk about the God that we serve, we talk about somebody who will be there for us. Even in our most lonely moments, he is with us. Do I have a witness? that he hears, he's open for prayer every time. I, I, I listen to all these things. I, listen, I would love to talk to you for about the next half hour about what God is. And everybody in here has a story. But the reason why I say that is because some people try to make it like, I can't do God because it's too hard. Well, if these are all the benefits I get, and by the way, this isn't a complete list, why would I not give God a chance in my life? Why would I not give God a chance in my life if I know these are the things that I can walk freely? Does it mean I'm going to have a perfect life and nothing will happen and I'll be, I won't have enemies and all this stuff? No, it doesn't. But it does mean you'll be equipped to handle it. Amen? It does mean that you've got everything you need to be able to do some amazing things with an amazing God. Amen? So by baptism, by letter, by Christian experience, you're absolutely welcome to come. Let me tell you a story. The group, this, the, the couple that joined this morning, uh, came from the Roman Catholic Church. And I said, when I grew up, uh, our church, if you came from a different denomination, they made you get baptized again. I said, I need you to know this is God's house. <laughs> If you got uh, baptized in a Roman Catholic church, you do not have to get baptized here again. You need to learn what it is that we believe versus what you have believed. But you can be right here in this place by Christian experience. I said to them, you need to know that man has done a job on us and we've allowed it. I said, if I was not, I said, if I wanted to leave this church, and go to another church because we're uh, where we are. I won't say what that is, but it's another Baptist denomination. If I didn't get baptized in their church, I couldn't take communion and I couldn't become a member unless I got baptized 
in their church. I said another Baptist church. And what I want to say to you is that's why when you hear me say we have an open communion, it means that everybody who believes in who Jesus Christ is, and he is their Lord and Savior, wherever you got baptized doesn't even matter. What matters is that you have a relationship with him. Do, do I have a witness here? Do I have a witness here? I want you all to know that's what it's all about. And so I just want you to know whether you're watching, whether you're listening, or whether you're here in the sanctuary, that's what we believe. And that's, can I say it? That's how we roll. So I just want you to know this is a great place. It's a safe place. And you have the opportunity to grow and develop in a tremendous way right here in this place. But if this is not where you want to go, this is not where you want to carry out your relationship with Christ, we will facilitate your ability to get where you want to go. Amen? We 